All right, welcome back uh, and welcome to this panel on labor and big tech in 2022 and beyond. Um, this panel is going to be more of a moderated discussion than the paper presentations that we've had in some of the previous panels. Um, so most of it is going to consist of me questioning the panelists, whom I will introduce in a moment. Um, I do hope to integrate the audience questions using the Slido uh, uh, website and app. So um, please feel free to pose those questions. I will try to uh, bring them into the discussion as they are relevant to the discussion that's going on among the panelists. Um, so without further ado, I'm Marshall Steinbaum, Assistant Professor of Economics at the University of Utah. Uh, the panelists uh, for this uh, discussion on labor and tech, so we're covering a, a wide variety of, of subjects, I think, with a, a panel that couldn't be better suited to, um, to this conversation of important uh, policy areas and new applications of antitrust. Um, we have Doha Meki, the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General at the Antitrust Division at USDOJ. Uh, Brian Kalachi, the Chief Economist of the Open Markets Institute. Hal Singer, who's Managing Director at Econ One Research and Adjunct Professor at the University of Utah Economics Department and the Director of our uh, new Utah Project on Antitrust and Consumer Protection. Uh, Melissa Holyoke, the Solicitor General uh, from the Office of the uh, Utah Attorney General. So I will uh, get us started on the discussion. So I guess I'll post the first question from here and then sit down with the rest of you. Um, so first to Doha, um, what's the significance of DOJ's memorandum of understanding with NLRB and with DOL? Uh, what kinds of enforcement efforts and or settlements might we expect uh, arising from those memoranda of understanding and uh, the uh, sort of policy innovations they represent? Awesome. Um, first, let me say thank you to the uni uh, University of Utah for having me. I'm really delighted and pleased to appear on such a distinguished panel. Um, so Marshall's exactly right. Uh, the antitrust division of the DOJ entered into a series of memoranda of understanding with a lot of our sister executive branch agencies. Um, and it's not just labor, right? We entered into them with the Securities and Exchange Commission several years ago. Um, we did the same thing with USDA, which uh, most notably had an interesting payoff in the slaughterhouse information sharing um, case that we filed earlier this year. Um, but the DOL, the Department of Labor, and NLRB um, memoranda of understanding are really special because I think they're largely reflective of the investment that we've made in um, focusing on competition in labor markets. Um, I think it's in the, the DNA of the agency. Um, that will be true for a very long time. And the memoranda uh, formalize the relationship between the antitrust division and those two agencies. Um, they contemplate a lot of things. They contemplate liaison officers. They contemplate um, sharing of certain non-public information about um, the experience of workers, right? Um, commuting times um, as just one example of data sets that we now have access to that we wouldn't have before. And so in terms of what does that mean, uh, I think you will see more of the same and probably better enforcement. Um, as many of you know, we've had a lot of um, civil cases, right? So the information sharing case um, earlier this year is one that we're really proud of. Um, we're going to continue our criminal enforcement, um, actually like charging uh, naked no poaching and wage fixing cases. Um, and you're gonna see a lot more advocacy. So this year, um, I can think of at least five amicus briefs or statements of interest that we filed in the federal courts and also in an NLRB proceeding about misclassification of workers. Um, and so I think that's that's what you will see going forward. Great. Well, I, I do have one follow-up question to that for you. Sure. Uh, uh, so my follow-up is one idea that's been sort of passed around among uh, outside government is this idea that you could remedy a merger that might harm labor markets through a union neutrality agreement or through promoting collective bargaining on the part of workers. Um, is that something that is on the agency's radar screen to the extent you can speak to that? Sure. Um, I will answer the question this way. So the literature is pretty clear that um, certain abuses of bargaining power, which the antitrust laws do address, um, can be aided by bargaining and unionization. And um, in particular, the relationship between weak wage growth and um, concentration can definitely be uh, ameliorated by um, unionization. And so, um, 
speaking plainly in hypotheticals, one can imagine that if the agency was concerned about abuse of bargaining power or a merger that created or enhanced uh, bargaining power, I'm sorry, uh, monopsony power in a labor market or a conduct problem um, that was in the vein of monopsony, one potential option on the table among many others is um, unionization. Um, and this is tricky, right? I mean, our preference in our merger cases is um, an outright injunction on the merger, right? Um, in conduct cases, we often don't have those luxuries, although certainly in our Section 2 enforcement, we might contemplate structural relief. But um, where behavioral remedies are um, more appropriate and conduct matters, you might see things like um, an agreement not to um, oppose uh, the certification of a union. Would any of the other panelists like to respond? No? <laughs> All right, well, thank you, uh, Doha. So moving on, um, uh, Chair Khan has said that the FTC will be starting an unfair method of competition uh, rulemaking under its Section 5 authority, that she said that directly to this conference earlier today, and, and it was discussed on some of the earlier uh, panels. But we had, in, in that specific context, we haven't yet discussed sort of what actual conduct might be implicated by that other than in very general terms. So my question for this panel is what conduct on the part of tech platforms might be implicated by uh, Section 5 uh, rulemaking under the FTC Act? And I'll, I'll let Hal answer that first. Well, um, thanks, Marshall. Uh, you know, it occurs to me that uh, one of my favorite uh, types of conduct that may not fall squarely within the antitrust ambit uh, is self-preferencing. But of course, we have a bill in Congress that has passed the Senate Judiciary Committee, I think 16 to 6. I'm not sure if uh, Chuck Schumer is going to bring it to the floor for various reasons. But um, I, I could see um, the FTC moving uh, in, in that direction. The problem, of course, is that if they move, that would, that would suggest that you know, maybe the legislation um, is not necessary. So I imagine there's a bit of a mouse or cat and mouse game going on as to who's going to move first. But that, that to me is the conduct that, uh, that uh, is clearly offensive, anti-competitive, but may evade antitrust scrutiny because, as you know, uh, that conduct occur occurs squarely within the firm's boundaries uh, as opposed to crossing the firm's boundaries with, a, with an input provider or a distributor. And there are no price effects and no output effects. The only harm is an innovation harm. It's an important harm, but it may not be a harm that you want to go with to an antitrust court if that's all you've got. Uh, Melissa? Well, I think I would first start with challenging the ability of the FTC to even do substantive rulemaking under uh, if whether they have the authority to do so. I know that uh, the chairman, the chairwoman um, is relying on petroleum refiners. Um, I would push back on whether that would actually hold up. I think there has there's been a, a case a couple of years after that, I think 20 years after that, United States versus Mead, where the Supreme Court talked about where this authority to do rulemaking comes from. And they really um, looked at what, where does this, this grant of authority from Congress come and whether the rulemaking is substantially related to that. So I think there's, you'll have, whatever rulemaking comes out, I think we will see whether that, I think it will get challenged. I think there's been a lot of um, criticism of the ability and it's never happened, uh, any rulemaking in this area. So the ability to actually have any rulemaking here will, will get challenged. Um, I think the self-preferencing, that's a really good question um, or a good point. And that might also get challenged because I think that has significant impact on companies all, all over. And I know there's been some discussion on whether the, the rules could even stand up to major questions or non-delegation doctrine challenges based on that. And that could have significant impact. Uh, on the self-preferencing matter, it seems uh, interesting to think that a sort of legislative uh, solution here is um, you know, kind of the more onerous route, at least to me, because as I understand it, that legislation really has very few uh, targets. That is, only only a couple of firms would be have their current uh, business models implicated by the legislation, whereas potentially the re the the FTC's exercise of authority could, you know, subject to what Melissa was saying, uh, basically bar self preferencing for a much wider set of of potential uh, market participants. <laughs> So to me, that says, well, why aren't they asking? Why why aren't the 
other, <laughs> the other constituents who would be harmed by the rule, why aren't they trying to get the legislation passed if that wouldn't affect them? Maybe they're relying on the fact that it'll just get shut down from the, Both the ability. Yeah, okay. yeah. And I think you'll see significant challenges to just the ability to bring any. Uh, so any other, I mean, the the discussion of Section 5 and its authorities to the agency, you know, covers way up more than self-preferencing and you're casting doubt on whether it could be uh, legally used for rulemaking at all. You know, are there substantive things that would then be overlooked? Because I feel like one of the reasons that so much uh, uh, faith is being put in that authority is the th idea that there's no other way to regulate the tech sector. And you're saying, oh, maybe this isn't a way either. But um, I think Section 5 can be used in a different way. I mean, in, yeah. even in the 2015 statement, they talked about the ability, I think it was a good bipartisan uh, balance to utilize Section 5 for research and, and as particularly studying areas of new conduct and, new, and developing new doctrine. And, and this would be, I think, perfect for that. In this big tech space, you're going to see all of these areas. They're, it's new novel areas that could be studied and new doctrine could be developed in those in those areas but got to do it quickly because as we know when <laughs> well, well, <laughs> those can take a while and then you lose your sh your chance yeah i mean we'll we'll get to that later in the panel is whether we've already lost our chance um uh, with the <laughs> with the rest of you want to <laughs> weigh in on this all right um okay so moving on um the ftc recently issued a gig worker policy statement um, and uh, Chair Khan spoke to that earlier today uh, as well. Some of us have pointed to a weakening of the jurisprudence of vertical restraints as constitutive of the legal viability of gig workers and especially uh, gig platforms. Um, what actions should we be looking to uh, to vindicate that policy statement, uh, either on the part of the agency or, or anyone else for that matter? Um, I'll let Brian answer that question uh, first, since you know we've co-authored those studies. So this is basically my my alter ego here. <laughs> Yeah, and I hope we get your take as well, Marshall. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, start with a positive. You know, it's certainly, the statement is certainly a step forward, uh, especially given past administrations. Uh, and the first thing I really like about it uh, is it says explicitly, I wrote down the quote, uh, while online gig platforms may seem novel, traditional legal principles of consumer protection and competition apply. Now, you know, Uber is a taxi company, DoorDash is a meal delivery service, uh, Handy is a non-union hiring hall. There's nothing new about these industries. Uh, you can't just bolt an app onto something and say, you know, it's, it's suddenly beyond existing laws. So that's positive. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, you know, framing this as a gig, econ gig economy statement, uh, it sort of ignores that or, or glosses over that the workplace issues affecting, uh, any trust issues affecting the workplace go way beyond the gig economy. Um, you know, the essence of the gig economy is using vertical restraints, you know, things like customer restrictions, price restrictions, exclusionary contracts, often dressed up in an algorithm that prevents multi-homing. Uh, and these are old issues. Uh, they're, they're in construction, they're in truck driving, uh, they're in a number of industries um, so that, you know, and that are much bigger than the app-based gig economy. So I'd like to see uh, you know, these issues applied to all workplaces. Um, you know, uh, I'll say two areas where I think the FTC uh, could build on this. Um, the first one is sort of picking up the ball where the First Circuit left it uh, with their case uh, regarding uh, the ruling regarding the Puerto Rican uh, horse jockeys. Uh, ruling that uh, they are entitled, even though they're not misclassified, they are, they are independent, um, genuine independent contractors, they uh, are allowed to engage, engage in collective activity like strikes. Um, that's the best way for workers to protect themselves. Um, so, and there is a, a foot, at least there's a footnote in the gig economy statement, uh, number 68, uh, that says the FTC, you know, will, uh, in light of the uh, First Circuit ruling, uh, will stop going after gig workers for collective organizing. But again, why stop at gig workers? Um, and the second area where I think they could build on it is, um, you know, the, the policy statement does uh, talk about what they call control with res without uh, control without responsibility business models. Uh, but, um, you know, the, the, uh, those kind of business models precede the gig economy by several decades, and the essence of them is, as Marshall just said, vertical restraints. And the FTC gig economy statement is silent on vertical restraints. Um, so what it does instead is uh, take the uh, disclosure under, rather than, rather than going after vertical restraints under any trust law, it goes after uh, disclosure, you know, deception and that kind of stuff under consumer protection law. Um, and uh, I, 
This is the approach the FTC took, I believe mistakenly, uh, with the franchise rule in 1979. Franchising is very similar to the gig economy. Uh, rather than sort of abandoning the FTC's early approach to use Section 5 to go after the coercive vertical restraints used against franchisees, independent oil, uh, oil, oil station dealers, and those kind of folks, uh, they went with uh, at the, the disclosure rule, which is just a disclosure statute. Um, and you know, giving uh, gig workers and any kind of independent worker more information, it may prevent fraud and deception but it just does not correct power imbalances. Uh, and the law of vertical restraints in the 60s and 70s recognized this, and it scrutinized vertical restraints more closely as unfair methods of competition. So I would like to see, you know, uh, sort of more boldness on, on, the, on the UMC front. Yep. Uh, so I also noted the same absence of discussion of vertical restraints in the gig work policy statement, and it did uh, discuss these issues of deception, which the chair also mentioned again this morning, uh, things like rideshare platforms telling drivers that they can make more money than is in fact possible to make. One thing I would say is that there's not such a strong distinction between the platform's use of deception and vertical restraints. So if we think about other ways that the platform's uh, deceive drivers, you know, that's really baked into the business model since they don't tell the drivers what the destination or fare of the rides that they uh, have to accept or reject are in advance. And that is really a way of preventing multi-homing as well as deceiving the drivers as, uh, as consumers in this context. And so I think one positive uh, aspect of the uh, gig work policy statement is that we could sort of push further on, at least from my perspective, is just having the agency recognize that deception isn't just bad on, for, on its own account as it is and uh, falls under their consumer protection mandate, but also that it has anti-competitive conduct, especially for powerful platforms dealing with disempowered upstream uh, intermediaries. Um, Doha, did you want to uh, weigh in on this? So Look, I, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to comment on another agency's enforcement here, but um, as an observer, I think um, it is very clear that they take labor issues seriously, particularly um, in the ways that they affect gig workers. But I want to um, circle back to a really important point that um, Brian made, which is that um, you know gig worker issues are just kind of the thing that's in front of us right now. There are a lot of different um, really like old sma smokestack industry kind of lines of work that are affected by many of the same problems. Um, so again, going back to um, our poultry uh, wage information sharing case, we had occasion to learn a lot about the chicken industry, right? And it's pretty well documented that um, chicken growers are um, folks who suffer from um, again, some serious bargaining asymmetries, right? Because you have large poultry processors that outsource um, risk and dictate terms and provide key inputs, including uh, feed and, and things like that. And you have these workers that just take on a lot of risk. Um, and I won't make assumptions, but I think uh, I suspect that they are underpaid um, for the risk that they take on. Um, I would also note that earlier this year, the um, antitrust division filed um, an NLRB brief um, in a matter affecting um, hairstylists and makeup artists uh, union. And that brief is a really important one and one that we're really proud of. Um, it does a few different things. Um, the first is it goes through the statutory history, right? So the value laid down by Congress when it passed the antitrust laws is competition. But we know that there are times when Congress has subordinated that value in favor of a um, coherent federal labor policy, right? And that's how we have the, non -statu the statutory labor exemption. And we know that the courts have read in um, a non-statutory labor exemption that brings in employers and allows them to bargain. Um, the second thing that it does is it recognizes that when there is ambiguity about who is an employee and who is not, um, it actually uh, subjects both workers and employers to um, uncertainty about antitrust liability, right? Because if they start doing things like engaging in bargaining, um, they are left vulnerable. And so they're subject to the prosecutorial discretion of agencies, which, as we all know, changes uh, potentially from administration to administration. The third thing, and I think this is right in the antitrust wheelhouse, is to say that when there are 
markets where one or more firms are engaging in misclassification, it actually creates unfair advantages um, to that firm, and it leaves law-abiding companies with the really unappetizing choice of either um, joining a potentially unlawful practice or ceding the market to its less scrupulous uh, rival. And so this is an antitrust problem. I think um, it was recognized by the California Supreme Court in the Dynamex case, and I think this is a really interesting potential green field um, for federal antitrust jurisprudence. Yeah, uh, putting on the hat of panelist as opposed to moderator, which I will just bestow a power I will just bestow upon myself. Um, I think that uh, is an ex uh, an extremely good point and harks back to something else that the chair said earlier this morning about the importance of distinct distinguishing substantively between fair and unfair methods of competition. So. Misclassifying workers is, at least putatively for this discussion, an unfair method of competition. And therefore, if it could run afoul of the law if the effect of it is basically to disadvantage other uh, rivals from uh, who would uh, uh, follow labor law and classify workers as, as employees, if that is in fact what they are. Al, did you want to say so something? I, I just thought it was interesting. I saw the story in Deal Book that the stock market valuation of a bunch of the delivery companies took a big dive in response to just the, the prospect of uh, this NLRB decision coming down against them. And it, what that told me is that, you know, so much of their value hinges on the mis misclassification of the workers. That is their value added. If you took away this secret sauce, there wouldn't be much value left in these companies. I'll just leave it at that. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I'll just, I, I got a bunch of calls from financial journalist types in response to this saying like, oh my God, does this mean that the gig uh, platforms aren't going to be viable or that employment classification is imminent? And I think trying to uh, prognosticate about the future of the sort of employment mis or independent contractor misclassification fight and the way the pendulum has swung in the various jurisdictions over a long period of time is, is hard to do. So certainly that uh, 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 statement pushes more in the direction of employment classification under FLSA, but by no means gets there. There's tons of litigation to come, no doubt. Um, but the sort of financial implication of it is that in, in order to avoid employment classification, the uh, platforms might be induced to extend more independence to the driver, substantive independence, things like the ability to accept or reject rides given full information unconditionally or see the, seeing the fare in advance. And I, under those circumstances, I suspect that the drivers would have to get paid more. I mean, they're being deceived now for a reason, which is that that, that gets them to do what the platforms want without having to pay if they aren't deceived anymore, they're going to have to pay to get them to take the rides that the, the platforms that don't want. And that is, in fact, a financial risk to the platforms, even short of a formal employment classification uh, a ruling of something like that. So one really interesting follow up on the um, uh, sort of steps that some gig platforms can take to uh, sort of exacerbate information asymmetries. I was reading, um, I don't know, probably in the last year or so about a um, food delivery platform that um, actually withheld API access for um, the Para uh, app that basically allowed couriers to see what the tip is for a particular delivery, right? And we know that they don't make a ton of money on particular rides as like a sort of part of their base compensation. And so the tip is their compensation. And so the ability of uh, couriers to accept and reject um, trips based on how much they were going to get in the tip was actually taken away by the platform. And I thought that was a very interesting hmm. um, step, uh, you know, beyond the kind of market structures that already give so much power to good platforms. So you're saying they they uh, uh, denied interoperability to this app that enabled that? Yeah. So so I think I have a question in my, in my toolbox for later on, um, but to forecast it now, I think this is exactly what Professor Athey is talking about when she talks about platform annexation, that you know, not only are they dominant, but they can prevent the sorts of uh, uh, intermediaries that would introduce competition. They can basically shut that down. Well, and I guess for a question for you, Marshall, so that reminded me, I know I'm just, when I take an Uber, you have that, that ability to pick a percentage. It just pops up automatically, like a percentage versus like a dollar amount. 
Is that another thing that that you're seeing Uber drivers like be able to? Is that the driver that's doing making that choice? Is that the algorithm? Or is that the so, so if you're saying that as a customer you get to choose the tip level as in no. dollars dollars versus percentage, it, it pops up automatically for different drivers. So I'm wondering okay. if that's yeah. So I, if that's true, I, I didn't realize that. I would say, and and that's interesting. The I think what Doha is talking about and what I was referring to when I said that the deception can take anti-competitive forms is essentially whether the driver gets to see what they get paid in advance. So mm -hmm. maybe, I mean, I don't think they do get to see, see what they get paid in advance. Maybe that, that has changed regardless of, of that setting. So I'm guessing that, you know, the, the Uber gave the drivers the ability to toggle between those things. That is some degree of a reduction in control, but it's not enough basically to mean that they can make an informed decision in advance about which rides to accept or reject. And they may give the drivers that right. I mean, they did in California after Prop 22 passed, um, where the drivers did have more meaningful control, then they imposed the sort of minimum acceptance rate. So you get to see more data if you keep uh, your acceptance rate above a certain threshold, which defeats the purpose of seeing the data in advance anyway. If you have to accept a certain number of rides in order to see the data, the whole point, the reason the data is valuable is, is so that you can reject the ride, yeah. uh, re re reject the rides. Um, so yes, I mean, I think, I think the platforms are in an ongoing, um, uh, you know, sort of experimental mode to sort of see what they can get away with. You know, obviously they want to keep the drivers accepting rides. They want to keep wait times short for customers and they want to keep their take rates high and <laughs> getting that through. I mean, they've got hundreds of technologists on staff for a reason to <laughs> figure out how to, how to thread that needle. Well, my next question is for you, Melissa. If we, oh. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, can you describe what enforcement efforts the Utah Attorney General has been involved in in the uh, tech platform space and where do those uh, efforts stand at the moment? Sure, sure. Happy to. Um, yes, so we have what I call a Facebook and three Googles. Um, and I'll just start with the Facebook case. So that was filed in December of 2020. Uh, it involved 48 states and territories, filed a complaint in the district court of uh, DC. Um, the FTC also filed a complaint at the same time, very similar. Um, and so we all know Facebook, right? You've seen the movie. They start out really small. They fight fiercely, uh, innovate, and they succeed massively. And so what happens? Uh, they end up with an IPO in 2012 of, I think, uh, over $11 billion. Um, and what do they do with that money? Uh, we believe they use that money to uh, buy off rivals and to uh, bury, buy or bury rivals to maintain their monopoly. So we've alleged three causes of action, um, unlawful maintenance of monopoly um, in the personal social networking services market in violation of section two of the Sherman Act, uh, Instagram acquisition that violated section seven of the Clayton Act and the WhatsApp acquisition that violated section seven of the Clayton Act. Um, and as I said, we what our complaint sets forth is basically a pattern of acquisitions to to help them unlawfully maintain their monopoly. Um, starting with Instagram. So Facebook identified a significant competitive threat in, in Instagram. Why? Because Facebook's photo sharing or photo um, service was not as good. And also uh, their transition from desktop to mobile was chunky at best and was not great. So uh, they acquired Instagram they also acquired Ovano, which is an Israeli analytics company, um, helped its clients with um, assessing and quantifying metrics, user engagement, market trends. Um, and then WhatsApp, which was a popular messaging um, app, which uh, they acquired in 2014. As of 2020, it wasn't even producing any sort of reliable revenue for Facebook. Um, then we also alleged uh, platform policies, which complemented this predatory acquisitions. Um, some of it was they were moving from an open platform that encouraged developers to integrate Facebook uh, software into their apps um, to one that cut it off, cut off developers, and also degrading the quality and functionality of the rival, their rivals, and their potential appearance. Uh, one example um, we gave was a photo sharing and editing app called Photo, P-H-H-H-O-T-O, -H -H -O -O, lots of H's, um, which was launched in 2014. 
Um, and what they did was Instagram by then, which was owned by, by Facebook, they started suppressing all the images that had a hashtag of PHHHOTO photo. So um, it uh, eventually, photo was shut down in 2017. So what were the harms to competition? The, the complaint alleged the following adverse effects, quality and variety of privacy options available, uh, reduced quality for users due to, due to the prevalence of fake accounts and increased ad load, um, reduction of user choice of competing platforms, and uh, suppression of innovation in the personal networking services. So what happened? Where is it now? Uh, there was a motion to dismiss filed, and in June of last year, it was granted. Um, and the court held that in the platform perform, um, policies that that claim lacked merit, um, that uh, as a general policy, refusing to provide API access to competitors was not a, did not violate section two by itself, but also that the specific instances of revoking like competitors API access or permissions after providing them, um, it could violate section two, but um, it was in 2015, so uh, there's no more current or impending violation. And um, as far as the acquisition claims, the district court held that they were untimely based on latches because the Instagram was 2012 and WhatsApp was in 2014. Um, so it was, we took it up on appeal and it was just argued last month. Um, and what we said was that latches doesn't apply to the states, uh, so we need to enforce the law. Um, but even if it did, the court here misapplied the doctrine because it presumed prejudice to Facebook as well as improperly assumed that the states unreasonably delayed the action. And then regarding the platform-based claims, we argued that the court wrongly concluded that the injunctive relief was not available because um, they, they, there was no basis to assume that Facebook had ceased this unlawful conduct. So we'll see, we'll see what happens. The, um, the FTC did refile, and so that they are um, in discovery right now. Um, okay, so our three Googles, our three Googles cases. So a few years ago, we started an um, investigation with uh, 48 states and three territories in the District of Columbia. And eventually the, that Google ended up into three different cases. Um, the first one uh, will not is that I'll talk about is Google Ad Tech, and that we filed we filed that in December 2020. Um, this one involves a coalition now of 17 states. It was initially started with 10, and, and more were added um, after the amended complaint. Um, in the ad in this this one the ad tech space, we are alleged five causes of action, uh, which are monopolization in violation of section two, attempted monopolization, unlawful tying in violation of section one and two, unlawful agreement in violation, violation of section one, and um, that it violated the Utah Antitrust Act. And other states had supplemental state law claims, but that was one important to us. Um, so this has to do with Google's advertising technology. So as you know, you go onto lots of websites and it's a lot of them are free or no cost because what do you see? Like right when you go to CNN.com, popping up lots of display advertising. And if you're on ESPN.com, let's pretend, uh, let's go back in, in a world of a few years ago. <laughs> um, websites used to act like newspapers where they would just buy space and it would put it randomly wherever it is. So it, if you were on ESPN.com, maybe you would have sports stuff. Um, but now it doesn't act like that anymore. You now it's it, there's a lot going on behind the scenes when you type in your your uh, website, um, and it's really this complex system of this auctioning system that's going on between the buyer, the seller, and this exchange. Um, and you have the the buyer, the advertisers who want to go put ads on. You have the seller, the the people, the publishers who have space, and then the auctioneers, the exchange system in the middle. And so what we argued is that um, Google was maintaining a mo monopoly um, of the ad exchange based on its manipulation of that system. So if you, to think about it this way, um, 
this is like Goldman or Citibank owning the New York Stock Exchange. Like you have a buyer and seller stock and the exchange. And so Google is both running the exchange and is the buyer, but their client is the seller. And so you have lots of problems here. Um, so that was one of the, the arguments that we made. Um, another one is their exclusionary conduct with respect to header bidding. And so what this does, so header bidding allowed this exchange to happen in like a no cost neutral auction, right? But what, what does Google see? Oh, no, 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 that I'm gonna lose some market power if this, if this happens. So it created a way to, it developed the exchange bidding, their exchange, and came up with ways to make that exchange slightly better than headier bidding to direct people there. Um, so for example, like Google wanted Amazon and Facebook to use the, added their exchange, and they came up with agreements that motivate Google and <laughs> Facebook to have no incentives to enter the market through header bidding, basically neutralizing those. And then um, the other portion of that case is the tying to Google's buy side platform. So if you're an advertiser and you want to, you have an ad campaign, let's say we're, I'm Ford, I have my great new ad campaign and I want to put it out on websites or where not, what not, you will utilize what's called a, is a buy side platform, a, a DSP, and they will help you kind of navigate through that market, manage and manage the bidding and whatnot. Um, and you want to use just one because it's expensive, right? So you want to use one that can go to multiple websites. What Google did was they have a DSP, but what they did was they tied that DSP to YouTube and so that you can, their, you can only use their DSP for YouTube. So obviously YouTube um, has one third of the internet. Just a side note on YouTube for a second. I, I don't get it. My kids will watch YouTube videos of other kids playing with action figures. And I'm like, you have that same toy over there. Like, just walk over there and get it. It's, it's crazy. But anyway, so they tied that by, by, create, by forcing people to use their DPS because you have to have YouTube. YouTube's enormous, right? Um, they're tying, that, tying, um, tying the, their DS, D, I'm sorry, not D, DPS, DSP to, to um, YouTube. Um, cuts off all of that, the, the rest of the, or requires them, people to use their DSP. And so where is that case right now? Um, that case we filed in, now I'm forgetting, oh, wait, Texas, hold on, Eastern District, maybe. December 2020. <laughs> I think um, it's in December 2020. Yes, in the Eastern District of Texas. But then it got moved um, to an MDL in New York, Southern District of New York, and hopefully some new legislation will avoid that in the future, those types of moves. Um, but because of all of that, discovery hasn't even started. So this we are really at the beginning of that case, and so we'll be lucky if we can get a trial in 2025. Um, then we have our Google search case. And you may have heard that you can do searches on Google. It's even a word now, Google search, <laughs> um, or Googled. Uh, so this case, again, also was filed in December of 2020. Uh, we have 38 US states and territories, again, in the DC District Court. Um, and the Department of Justice was also filed a case, related case. Um, and in that case, very similar, uh, we brought claims for maintaining a monopoly of general search services in violation of section two, uh, maintaining a monopoly of general search advertising by violation of section two, two, and maintaining a mo monopoly of general search text advertising in violation of section two. Um, and in this, we argue that Google contracted to maintain their monopoly power of the searching. So Google, what is, what is Google really? It's, it's an advertising company. They're getting your data. They're selling advertising. They, they make all of their money through advertising. Um, and so what they need to do is on your mobile phone is make sure that you are getting to Google. So how do they do that? 
they contract to make sure that that is the default and you are getting there. Um, and so they lock up what is known as search access points on your phone um, to get, and so that Google has approximately 95% of all searches. Um, and they have entered into agreements with phone manufacturers and mobile carriers to get there, um, both um, in the Android space and in the Apple space. Um, and that case, we have just finished fact discovery. So we will see uh, where that goes shortly. And then our last case. It's the best case. It's the best case <laughs> because the first name is Utah versus Google. So <laughs> I went to the University of Utah, so this is coming full circle. This is great. And also, it's the best case because we have the best economist. <laughs> Hal Singer. So, um, so this case the, is the IAP case. And this is about the Google Play Store. So if you have an Android phone, first, uh, just to step back for a second, Android operating system, they opened it up. It was open source. So manufacturers, you know, they, they wanted to use it. They used it. And then once they got this critical mass, uh, then they started utilizing contracts and other restraints to keep that, uh, that monopoly power. Um, and one of them, uh, so what they did was when you buy your Android phone and you power it up for the first time, whatever it is, a Samsung or whatnot, you will see a Play Store that shows up on the phone. And that, the Google Play Store, is where you buy all your apps. Because other, if you don't have apps, you may as well just dial Rotary. I mean, it doesn't make sense. The reason why these, these phones are so fun is because you can, we can do all these other things with all these apps. So you have to go to the Google Play Store to add apps. Um, and 90% of the downloads are coming through this Google Play Store. So what, the, uh, so what Google did is they limited um, a couple of channels of distribution of, app, of Play Store. And they did that. Um, in a couple of different ways. So one of them is preloading, which I had mentioned. So there's agreements that required that these, these manufacturers, they have to have Google Play Store on their phone. So when you turn it on for the first time, it shows up, right? Um, another thing that they did was limit the ability to sideload. So what does that mean? That means you want an app, you go to a, a website on your phone, and it says, oh, download app here. You're like, oh, I don't even have to use the Google Play Store. Great. So you click on the link, and what happens? You get lots of warnings. Your phone is going to destruct right now if you click on this link. So lots of warnings. And what's interesting about these warnings is that they're warning you about apps that they actually sell on Google Play Store. So, they're, so it's very interesting. Um, and then the third thing they do is that they have agreements regarding with developers on launching content, right? So the developers can't, uh, can't uh, contract with other app stores to launch titles before Google Play, or, or they, and they have to be about the same. They have to have feature parity. Then the, um, the other argument that we have in this case has to do with in-app billing. So what is in-app billing? What's an in-app purchase? You are on your get your favorite game, whatever it is, Candy Crush, I don't know. Um, I don't, my husband has spent so much money on these games. So I'm like, I, I'm happy to bring this case. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and uh, so you want to do, get an extra sword or an extra box or whatever. There's like, you know, new characters and a new sword, whatever there is. And so you have to purchase the, uh, you want to purchase that. And where, you click on the app and you want to purchase it. So what happens? You have to use, or you're using Google's billing services. And so they've tied that in. And so we have a tying claim to that, to that product. Um, and what's interesting is, or what makes this um, a very expensive case is that as we have contributed, you know, we've spent a lot of money. Well, I guess we don't have the Androids. But anyway, <laughs> that they're charging commissions um, of 30%, which we know would be is extraordinary compared to what, 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 it would ha what would happen if you have a different billing service involved. Um, 
And I would love to hear from my expert. No? <laughs> Not a chance. No? <laughs> 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 ah, well, you had a great hot tub experience. Yeah. Do you want to describe that? Wow. And for, for people, does anyone know if maybe we should explain what a hot tub is for those who've never heard of it? I don't want to explain a hot tubbing. <laughs> <laughs> hot tub time oh, machine. Yeah, there's a, the judge in the case, Judge Donato, uh, asked the uh, expert economist to debate, and he's the moderator of the debate. And so we had our first one for the class certification. And um, we're about to have, well, we're not about, in March, we're going to have our second one for the merits phase. So I don't know who my opponent will be in that one, but I encourage you strongly if, you're, if you want to come, it's open to the public and you might hear some fun things there. Uh, well, I, I guess that partially answers the very last thing I was going to ask is where does the play source sta case stand oh, now yes. for, yeah, uh, yeah. to finish up? I, that was a masterful delineation of everything, so nice work. <laughs> But yeah. Uh, oh yeah. So yes, we've we have our expert reports in where we expect theirs um, in com com coming weeks, and then we are set for trial in June. Oh, that's 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 a quick one by it is. standards and of tech yes, platform anti. -tech. I know when you have one case that hasn't even started discovery, and then our case where we I I am very excited to see Hal on the stand. <laughs> I think you're going to be fabulous. <laughs> um, anyone who saw him last night can can imagine that 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 is where he shines. I. Absolutely. I would suggest. Um, I want to ask one question from the audience, and then we'll get to platform annexation. So um, uh, we have a, a question. Uh, someone earlier called website terms of use coercive. What about arbitration clauses and class action waivers buried in those terms? Could the FTC say that such waivers are unfair under Section 5 uh, without running into the Federal Arbitration Act? Um, so I will ask that question to Brian if he's willing to answer it, because I feel like he could. Uh, actually, I can't because I'm not a lawyer, but it's, it does seem like uh, I'm just a mere economist, but it does seem like a Federal Arbitration Act would throw up some preemption issues. That's what you guys call it, right? I, I also think that those clauses um, that are in particular in Amazon's contracts with merchants prevent um, class actions of being brought by merchants. And so um, it was very you know, smart of Amazon to do, I guess. Uh, but, but if those went away, you might see some private enforcement against uh, certain conduct that's aimed at merchants on the platform. OK. Uh so I want to uh, ask a sort of open-ended question uh, about platform annexation, and, and just to uh, tee this up, um, earlier Doha was referring to uh, denying intermediation to an app that would have given uh, 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 food delivery drivers information in advance about their uh, fares. This also is what uh, uh, Melissa was describing in the case of uh, Google bundling um, the uh, buyer uh, ad service to YouTube in the sense that they're basically saying, well, you know, this buyer ad service is going to preference YouTube or uh, Google's properties and not be a neutral intermediary. So um, a couple of weeks ago, um, Susan Athey presented a paper about platform competition that highlighted the role of intermediaries on each side of a two-sided platform um, as mediators for price comparison, customer multi-homing, and uh, ultimately platform competition. But it seems that given uh, existing platform dominance, there's no way to ensure neutrality and interoperability for such intermediaries, as evidenced by the two examples I just referred to. Um, if they do, in fact, invite price competition, dominant incumbents will simply cease to interoperate. Um, it seems that we may have convinced ourselves that platform monopoly was inevitable until it was too late. Um, so what should happen now uh, to rectify that? And I'll let Hal uh, answer that first. Anyone else can weigh in. Oh, what should happen now to rectify um the inability of, of, of intermediaries or to... Or well, the, yeah, so, so what, what Susan was saying is basically we shouldn't allow platforms to annex intermediaries that play that, comp that role of introducing competition. And my claim is that, you know, it's sort of too late to do that because they're not going to actually be able to introduce competition given that the platforms are dominant. If they do introduce competition, they'll just be shut off. Yeah. I think that, that uh, merchants um, on the supply side of the platforms want to be able to multi-home and as do as do consumers, and what these what a lot of the strategies that prevent that 
our aim to do is prevent uh, what I call steering. I didn't invent the term, but the steering is a very simple idea that um, you'd like to be able to steer your customer to the lower cost platform if it would cause you to uh, avoid or to at least in- incur a smaller cost than you otherwise would if you stay with the dominant platform. So just to take, a, I, mean, I don't know where I'm coming up with this number, 30%, but you know, if you're faced with a 30% take rate or tax and there was a platform outside that could transact uh, your business at say a 10% take rate um, and your product say cost $100, um, you know, there's a lot of money to be saved if you could get your your customer to to consummate the transaction on the lower cost platform. In fact, it's a 20 percentage points off of $100 if I just did that right. So you have $20 to play with. And what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to tell the customer, communicate to the customer that if he or she um, transacts at the lower cost platform, you're going to drop the price. I mean, you have at least $20 to play with. And all of these strategies, I think that the common denominator, whether it's Amazon's MFNs or uh, you know Google's uh, anti-steering provisions, but I hope I didn't get in trouble for saying that, um, is all intended yeah. to stop um, that sort of, of uh, competitive behavior, right? It's, uh, it's, it's aimed at, at, at locking in the, the merchant and its customer in the high cost, high take rate platform. And, um, and I think that, that this is the key strategy. They figured it out. It's, it's, it's effectively a gag order. It's preventing a, a merchant uh, or a developer from, from communicating to their client uh, that there is a lower cost transaction to be had. And, and, and that is precisely what sustains um, and pre- prevents multi-homing, sustains uh, anti-competitive and, and, and uh, inflated take rates. And until we figure out a way to... Um, to uh, pr- prevent this conduct from occurring, um, merchants, developers, and their and their ultimately their customers are going to be paying higher prices uh, as a result. Those higher take rates, and this is a central controversy in the in our case, uh, get passed along uh, to consumers in the form of higher end user prices. Right, the the way that you pay for or compensate for that thirty percent tax is by raising your price. And the way that we know this is that. In the rare instances where big providers are able to steer, um, basically when, when you bought, when you download from their websites, they always, always, always offer a lower price for their product. Why are they doing that? They're doing it because they don't have to pay the 30%, and so they're willing to share some of that savings with their customers. Marshall, can I follow up? You know, I think your question is an interesting one because it presupposes that um, we've figured out too late um, some of the problems with platforms. and. I'm not sure that that's true. Um, so I should say, Susan Athey is the chief economist at the antitrust division. She's brilliant. We are so excited that she is um, part of the antitrust division. And I, I think that we are huge beneficiaries of her insights. Um, there are very few people who have devoted more time to understanding the economics of digital platforms. You know, the platform annexation paper that she co-authored with Fiona Scott Morton um, sort of assigns this name, like annexation, to the phenomenon of um, digital platforms acquiring tools, right, or services. And we have this challenge in antitrust where we call some things horizontal and some things vertical. And I think we are becoming lucid to why those um, categories, strictly speaking, can be very problematic. And so what they do is say platform annexation is um, you know, the label for what happens when you have a merger that um, doesn't actually resolve conflicts of interest, right, and um, provide cost savings to consumers, right? Like that's the sort of old adage about, um, you know, pro-competitive nature of certain kinds of vertical acquisitions. They actually create more conflicts of interest, right? So when you have digital platforms that play on both sides of the market, um, they create them, they are able to increase their take rate, as uh, Hal just explained. And I think that there's a role to play in our merger law for being more lucid, be, like being able to see after many years of clearing these kinds of mergers or not being being fully lucid uh, to the challenges that they create to be more circumspect um, about those kinds of transactions. And you know, in terms of conduct matters, right? Like what happens when those platforms become too big? Um, Assuming you can get to a liability finding, I think the other recommendation they make in their paper is beyond sort of structural um, relief, which I think is very important, right? Breakups have to be on the table, especially when dominant platforms are dominant because of acquisitions, um, that 
you know, in the category of forward-looking remedies, things like interoperability, things like multi-homing are things that um, prevent the platform from exercising dominance. So I take your point about, you know, this is an intervention in somewhat deconstructing the formalisms in merger policy. I guess my, my, my you know, somewhat uh, hesitant criticism is on the second point that, like, really it's possible to, pr to uh, protect multi-homing and interoperability at the remedy stage short of a structural solution. So it's basically, you're saying these things go together or could reinforce each other, and I'm saying the second thing is not going to work if you don't do the first thing. I, I think we're in agreement. Um, good. Well, on that note, I will ask you a um, awkward question, <laughs> Doha. Uh, notwithstanding all the discussion about uh, revolution and antitrust enforcement inaugurated uh, by the Biden administration at both agencies and, and from the White House and this whole of government approach um, that we've heard about, um, neither federal agency has filed a new monopolization case um, since the current leadership took over, um, either against a tech platform or, as far as I know, against any other defendant. So could you tell us why that is to the degree that you can? Thank you for the awkward question. Um, so uh, look, one of the challenges to answering that question candidly, which I often I try to do when I get uh, questions in that vein, is that so much of the department's work is like a glacier, right? The public is aware of the stuff that is public, right? And so much of our work is confidential. Um, and there are very good reasons for that, right? Due process reasons for that. Um, that's not to say that there's no work happening behind the scenes. Um, and so that is all I'm going to say about monopolization, except for maybe that um, our phenomenal AAG, Jonathan Cantor, is um, an expert on Section 2 enforcement. He is serious about reinvigorating Section 2 enforcement. And I suspect that you're going to see um, plenty of activity in that vein, especially as he gets past his first year um, and focuses more on um, the enforcement, the affirmative enforcement agenda um, that he's described to the public. Um, that said, we're not doing nothing, right? Um, we have had a really busy year in terms of our enforcement. Um, we have six ongoing lawsuits. Um, at one point this year, we were trying United Health Group Change and Penguin at the same time in different courtrooms in DDC, and then a month later tried two more merger trials, right? We're um, actively litigating American Airlines JetBlue up in Boston, and there was also the Booz Allen Hamilton Everwatch um, PI hearing in Baltimore. Um, I have worked at the DOJ for almost eight years. I cannot think of a time when there were more than like three or four civil lawsuits going at the same time. And that's to say nothing of the abandonments that we've gotten, right? Cargo Tech uh, Kona Cranes, CIMC Maersk, First Attack Cranes, um, and others, right, that we can't talk about because on the issuance of a second request, the deals fell apart. Um, we also have more open grand juries uh, than at any time in our history, and that's all with fewer than um, 300 fewer attorneys than we had in 1979, and I'll leave you guys to guess what happened in the 80s, right, to the, the budget of the antitrust division. Um, and so we're busy, right, and that's notwithstanding um, record HSR filings um, and a very large active monopolization case um, that is Google search. Hal, did you want to uh, weigh in on that? No, I just, I was anxious for the Amazon suit, but... Um... And I, I, I couldn't tell from your answer if it's coming, but I guess we, we can wait on pins and needles. Uh, well, then I will turn to ask how the awkward question. Um, uh, so um, we heard uh, from Ramogi about uh, uh, antitrust and other efforts in uh, among college athletes, which have been among the most exciting in the sort of whole labor and antitrust ecosystem that has uh, grown such a... Uh, a long way in the last couple of years. Um, those who know me know that I'm not one to usually uh, don the interest of my employer as being my interest and what I vocalize, but I'm going to do so in this in this instance. Um, we, uh, Ramogi mentioned that, uh, the, that UCLA and USC announced plans to leave the Pac-12 uh, College Athletic Conference. And my question for you, which is, I, I think, um, uh, you know, one that that a lot of people in in uh, Utah uh, have voiced in response to that is that the uh, antitrust enforcement uh, against the NCAA as a labor cartel um, is 
going to cause conference consolidation because it's going to mean that only a few smaller number of schools and a smaller number of markets can afford to compete at the highest level of college athletics. Um, and as a, a Pac-12 school that isn't in Los Angeles, I think a lot of people in, in this area are uh, concerned about, about developments like that. So what would you say to that as a criticism of the NCAA antitrust enforcement? Well, I, I think it's a stretch to, to, to connect the two. I think that the reason why you see consolidation is completely, I'm going to use an economic term, just orthogonal. It, it, there's a completely different reason that has nothing to do with antitrust litigation. And what they're doing is they are in a bargaining game uh, with, with cable operators over license fees. And so they, uh, they want to be able to command the highest license fee possible and the way that they do that is by consolidating you know all the good teams all the big name teams together into under one roof and then they're able to extract larger payments from the cable operators so i think that would happen with or without antitrust enforcement against the cartels the wage cartels and so it just seems like a fairly weak suggestion that that the, the antitrust enforcement is the cause of consolidation I just, I'm glad that Utah beat USC before they left. <laughs> right, that's the right answer. Uh, and it also shows it, that underlines Hal's point. Uh, so yeah, we're done here. I, I, I like that. Um, uh, okay, so uh, moving on. Um, uh, and this is, uh, again, uh, speaking to some of my own work uh, with Brian, um, we have worked on franchising where uh, vertical restraints are constitutive of the business model. They've typically been interpreted as uh, pro-competitive -com because they're effic efficiency enhancing within the sort of production process that is represented by the franchising chain um, and therefore pro-consumer. The implication being that a more efficient production process gets passed along to consumers in the form of lower prices. Um, so if the franchisees themselves are disadvantaged by that control, who cares? Because all we care about is, is low prices. Um, we know that uh, vertical restraints can be used by dominant platforms to impede competition uh, by enforcing single homing on upstream counterparties. This is what uh, Hal was uh, talking about in the case of uh, platform MFNs um, and equivalent conduct like gag orders. Um, the distinction that I've heard made uh, specifically by economists in this vein about sort of measuring the pro versus anti-competitive uh, potential effects of vertical restraints is that they're pro-competitive insofar as they implicate solely the division of surplus in a bilateral relationship, um, but they would be exclusion they, they they would be exclusionary and therefore anti-competitive if they bind the counterparty not to deal with a third-party rival of the dominant firm. So this is a, a what uh, Steve Salop calls raising rivals' costs theory, or um, the kind of. Uh, uh, theory that was at play, for example, in the Apple eBooks uh, antitrust litigation, although in that case they actually got a ruling that it was a horizontal hub and spoke conspiracy. But leaving that aside, the, the theory is, is in effect a, a vertical one. Um, <clears throat> Does that so? My question uh, first for Brian is basically: Does that distinction between the sort of bilateral exercise of bargaining power to redistribute surplus versus the uh, implication of third-party competition hold up if labor is an antitrust constituency, as we've talked about a lot on this panel and, and for the rest of this conference? Yeah. So, um, and I hope this isn't a frustrating answer. Uh, so please weigh in uh, with your own take uh, if it is. Uh, but, you know, we heard this morning about, um, you know, sort of framing things in terms of fair and unfair methods of competition. And I think, you know, especially when we're talking about labor, uh, that is the correct frame. Um, and, I, and I think it, it, it illuminates some things that uh, the frame of, um, you know, pro and anti-competitive conduct uh, does not. Um, so I prefer the unfair, unfair methods of competition uh, frame here. Because, first of all, because I think it is more true to the language of the FTC Act and even the Clayton Act. Uh, but second, um, you know, even if you can show that a vertical restraint, uh, like the ones in franchising, say maximizes output under some set of assumptions, you can even show that output empirically that it goes up, it can do so through means that are in fact harmful. Uh, and in particular, by denying workers rights. Now, I mean rights that they have under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the National Labor Relations Act, and a whole slew of other labor laws. So that's kind of you know, the injustice happening here. Um, and labor rights apply against any employer. Um, you know, it's not, uh, it's not about what your outside, outside options are. It's not whether you're excluded from dealing with another employer. It's just you have a boss, you have labor rights. 
And I think that's sort of an important thing uh, to keep in mind when we have um, you know, sort of antitrust techniques or you know, competition techniques like vertical restraints uh, used to exclude our workers from their employment rights. Uh, now, just real briefly, you know, the, the use of vertical restraints in this manner really dates back from uh, the passage of the New Deal era Fair Labor Standards Act and National Labor Relations Act because these laws applied very broadly. So the, NLRB, the uh, Supreme Court in NLRB versus Hearst uh, ruled that the National Labor Relations Act, which gives an affirmative right to collective bargaining, applied to uh, what were called newsboys. They were grown men, but you know, uh, they were called newsboys. And what they did was they would buy newspapers from Hearst and you know, distribute them to the public uh, and pocket the difference. Uh, and what the court, so they're not wage workers. Uh, so, and uh, what, the, what the Supreme Court ruled is that because of the vertical restraints, because of the price restrictions, the territory allocations, uh, the, uh, all, all the, the range of vertical restraints, look, you've got an employee there and gave them employment rights. The Taft-Hartley Act overturned that decision, so now you know, uh, independent contracts are excluded from the NLRA. Uh, but um, what, 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 that, what the Taft-Hartley Act did was open up just an enormous incentive for employers to misclassify their workers as independent contractors to avoid, to violate all these laws. Um, so look, in anti, in, uh, uh, just to throw in some, um, I, I, just, I guess I just did throw in some labor law, but you know, in the antitrust and industrial organization literature, uh, we sort of treat vertical restraints and vertical integration uh, pretty much the same because they have similar economic justifications in terms of uh, re you know, uh, re uh, reducing transactions costs, reducing agency costs, you know, elimination of double marginalization, stopping free riding, that kind of stuff. Um, but um, I, what that, when we treat them the same, uh, we're ignoring that under uh, vertical integration, those are employees with rights, and under vertical uh, restraints, they are independent contractors without rights. And so that's sort of the um, that's what I see as one of being one of the major issues uh, with the um, with the use of vertical restraints in this way. So I think this area of the law is hugely fascinating, and I um, maybe it's just the hubris of uh, an antitrust enforcer. Um, I think competition does have something to say about this, and I. I worry that the law is misconceived um, around some of the franchise restraints. So um, again, I'm not a fancy economist uh, like Brian or Marshall or Hal, I, but you know, to sort of put it in plain English, what is happening is you have um, franchisers, right? A McDonald's, a Burger King, um, those kinds of um, entities saying, we have to limit the mobility of our workers because it helps us sell more hamburgers. Um, I, I find that, to use a technical term, bananas. Um, <laughs> I think that anyone who has ever hired anyone to do anything, right, knows that there is some level of training that is required to get the thing that you want done, right? You hire a babysitter, you have to tell your babysitter where stuff is, and essentially we have an area of law that has justified um, you know, the movement of workers because um, you know, you had to teach someone who makes minimum wage how to operate a fryer. And I think the question I would pose to this audience and, and to you, Marshall, I, I suspect we probably agree on some of these issues, is how much training, right, and what is the cost of that training that you think is required to teach an adult human how to operate a fryer? Right? And again, the idea that you could justify the movement of workers right, on that basis, again, I think is without justification. Um, and nonetheless, that, that, is, that is the state of the law, right? Multiple uh, franchisors have prevailed um, in class action cases um, under that framework. The other thing that uh, I think this area of the law has neglected, or I guess it's not the area of the law, the, the sort of the current jur jurisprudence has neglected is that all of the surplus the workers create ultimately accrues to the benefit of the franchisor. And so whether someone works at a McDonald's on the east side or a McDonald's on the west side, again, it all accrues to the benefit of the franchisor. And so, you know, I think there's a big open question, again, and I, antitrust Greenfield about this issue of cross-market balancing. And I, I know Hal has a lot to say about cross-market balancing and has thought about this issue a lot. Um, what is really interesting is that the NCAA v. Alston case that Ramogi was talking about earlier um, walked right up to the line, right? Justice Gorsuch is writing the majority opinion. He says, and there's this question about whether um, you know, reducing the wages of college athletes to zero 
can be justified because you think that more people are going to watch NCAA basketball and football if that is the case. And then he says, writing for the court, it's a 9-0 opinion, he says, but that issue isn't teed up. And so we will not go there. And he drops a footnote to the American Antitrust Institute amicus brief that tees up this issue squarely. And so I think there is another case that Jeff Kessler is working on that is going to explode these issues, but they are hugely interesting. Um, and I think they will affect every corner of the US economy. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm anxious to see the next case, but I don't know if I'm gonna live long enough to see uh, the courts <laughs> sort this out. And so, you know, we do have another tool, which is Congress. And so I'm peddling to anyone who listens to me this uh, notion of a no offset rule, but it'd be very simple. But, you know, in, in wage fixing cases, what I want to do is stop courts from engaging in, in multi-market balancing, uh, which is what's going on in the NCAA cases, but also happened in the Amex case. If you think they, they were able to bring in the, an offset to known and obvious harms to merchants by defining the market as a two-sided market. So you had the same result in both cases. In Amex, they needed a two-sided market to get to offsets. In the NCAA case, in the Alston case, they did it outside of the very market. They actually went outside of the market and looked at the purported uh, benefits uh, to, for amateurism, a taste for uh, exploitation. Um, so the, the simple, you know, we can either wait for the courts to fix this, uh, or I just want to submit that we do have Congress and we could simply pass a law that would compel courts, would bar courts um, from engaging in any kind of offsetting benefits. In other words, if a plaintiff brought a case, uh, say a, a single firm monopsony case, um, uh, as soon as the plaintiff is able to establish harm to the input provider, to the worker, um, you could, the defendant could present efficiencies, but, but they would be limited to those efficiencies that redound to the benefit of harmed workers. They would be barred, the defendants would be barred from presenting efficiencies that redound to any other uh, person, consumer, any other party. It would have to be, you know, to the, to the very party that was harmed itself. And, and of course, in a wage fixing case, as we have in the NCAA cartel, um, no efficiencies would be considered. I mean, that would be consistent with the way that we treat price fixing conspiracies. If you're a defendant in a price fixing conspiracy, uh, you can't go up and say, I've got a good efficiency defense. It's just a per se violation. So why are we, why are we considering efficiencies in a, you know, in a wage fixing case? I mean, I know why and it, it, it might hurt to tell you, but it's, you know, I don't, I don't think that workers achieve the same, um, ranking as consumers under the consumer welfare standard. You know, um, I, I read this book, Elizabeth, uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book, uh, cast. I don't know if you if you guys had a chance to read that, um, but about, um, you know, the Jim Crow era to the South and the caste system in India. Uh, but you know, different people rank differently in those systems. And, and uh, to me, it's pretty clear where, you know, where workers rank uh, under the consumer welfare standard, um, at least in relation to consumers. Consumers are at the top of the hierarchy and uh, the courts seem to be willing to go looking for you know, consumer benefits that can offset the clear harms to either the workers or to, or to other input providers. So if you wanna fix it, we we could uh, there's a there's a strike that would have it it done in our lifetimes and I just wanted to put that out there. Good. Well, uh, thank you. If we have anything to do with it, we will uh, uh, fix it in, in the way you suggest. So uh, I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you to the panelists um, and uh, to the audience. Thank you.